Hi guys, so the title of this video is How to be a gold digger and before you come at me the title is, you know, a little bit facetious and you will see why but in all seriousness, this video is mainly going to be covering the legal issues surrounding divorce proceedings the division of matrimonial assets alimony custody, etc, etc. So if you are interested in finding out more about those issues, please continue watching. So I was actually inspired to film this video because of an SG Reddit thread that has recently surfaced in Singapore. So this Reddit thread is actually based on a CNA article and just for clarity, I will briefly summarize what the CNA article is about. So the title is Man admits posting image on Facebook of his wife having sex with her supervisor and this article is dated 21st September 2021. So just to summarize the important facts, a husband who was estranged from his wife basically stole her phone and took snapshots of the phone's contents and some of these pictures include uh, images of his wife having sex with her supervisor with both their faces visible as well as photos and screenshots of her private messages with the supervisor. So the man posted all of these uh, images and screenshots onto Facebook. The post was made public and it went viral. It was shared thousands of times and obviously these are criminal offenses in and of themselves. Uh, the first being theft and the second being intentionally distributing the intimate images of another person. So aside from this CNA article, this video is actually made directly in response to the SG Reddit thread that has arisen based on this CNA article. So as a disclaimer, before I start anything, I would like to stress that I am not a lawyer, I am not a qualified lawyer, I am only a recently graduated law student and I'm wearing the blazer to fit the occasion of a legal explanation video. So please do not take any of this as legal advice. I am just trying to explain some legal concepts in a way that is maybe a little bit easier to understand or just to shed some light on the legal issues. So please do not treat this as legal advice. I would also like to stress that this video is meant to be explanatory in nature. So I'm just going to be breaking down the certain elements of family law that will be relevant to the comments being made in this particular Reddit thread. So there is actually no mention of divorce in the CNA article. We can see that the husband who shared the photos is still married to his wife. But in the Reddit thread, I think there were many people who jumped straight into talking about divorce or making arguments based on divorce laws. And there were many Redditors who were of the opinion that this was going to lead to quite an unfair situation because even if the man filed for divorce and adduced evidence of the wife's adultery, at the end of the day, the wife would still be able to take half of his money, take uh, full custody of the children, you know, get alimony from him and basically be able to win the divorce even though she was the person who was committing adultery. So basically the gold diggers would be able to do this over and over again and there is nothing to help the vulnerable men who have found themselves in this situation. Or in the words of Redditor Beck Borrow Steel, this man was quote, cut by his wife and the law, unquote. So now I would like to break down some of the misinformation that is being shared in this Reddit thread. So firstly, I think that there are a lot of people conflating certain issues or components relating to divorce. Basically, I see a lot of commenters just grouping everything together. The grounds for proving divorce, maintenance of the wife, maintenance of the child, custody of the child, division of assets, they kind of just group all of these things together. But legally speaking, there are different statutes and different laws governing each of these areas. So we can't just make blanket statements about all of these things at the same time. So if you look at the first step of securing a divorce, which is basically that the plaintiff needs to prove that there is an irretrievable breakdown of their marriage. And based on the woman's charter and the relevant statutes, there are five different ways you can do so. So one of the ways you can prove that your marriage has broken down irretrievably is that the defendant has committed adultery and the plaintiff finds it intolerable to live with the defendant. So I would say that if we are going to use the CNA article as an example, the plaintiff husband would be able to admit 
the pictures of his wife committing adultery with the supervisor into court and it will form direct evidence that she has committed adultery and because they are no longer living together it would be sufficient to show that uh, the plaintiff finds it intolerable to live with his defendant wife and therefore he would be able to quite successfully file for divorce using this ground. So if you are able to successfully prove one of these grounds and show that there is an irretrievable breakdown of marriage and the interim judgment of divorce is granted by the court, only then will we move to discussing ancillary matters which as I have mentioned include custody, care and control of the children, maintenance of the child and ex-spouse, as well as the division of matrimonial assets. So basically all issues excluding the actual divorce. The idea of gold diggers being able to marry a rich partner, take half of their assets, take full custody of the child and repeat this process over and over and over again is quite frankly very presumptuous and also not very feasible. But I would say that marriage and divorce proceedings are a lot more complicated than that. The court has to take into account factors like the length of the marriage, financial and non-financial contributions, the welfare of the child, etc, etc. So what exactly do the courts consider? Let me explain. So first discussing the division of matrimonial assets, which I feel like the angry people on Reddit are most concerned with. I will basically put up the statute here for you to read but generally it flows from this idea that married parties are regarded to have contributed to the acquisition of property during the length of their marriage so this would count whether they did so financially or not so just to give you an example let's say that one spouse didn't pay for 50 percent of the matrimonial home but they paid for some of the upgrades to the house or paid for some of the furniture or for example, they rejected a promotion or only worked part-time or gave up their job altogether to take care of the children just so that the other spouse would be able to work full-time and pay for the monthly mortgage installments. Those are things that the court will take into account when dividing the pool of matrimonial assets because it will be based on what each party has contributed. So the court takes, as you can see, quite a holistic view. They don't just look at the dollar value that each person is putting in. And if you notice, throughout the whole time I was talking, adultery doesn't come into play at all. Because whether or not someone has committed adultery or cheated on their spouse, it doesn't take away from the fact that they have made significant financial or non-financial contributions to properties or assets that were acquired during the marriage, which is why adultery is not relevant for the eventual division of these assets when it comes to divorce proceedings. So when I read the angry comments on the Reddit thread that are basically saying it is very unfair and unjust for the adulterous home-wrecking woman to receive any proportion of the matrimonial assets, the only reason I can think of that can justify why they think this way is because they feel like the division of matrimonial assets or divorce laws in general should be put in place to punish the adulterous wife. It has been recognized by the court itself that the court's power to divide matrimonial assets and basically to grant uh, any of the other ancillary matters is not meant to be punitive in function. You can't just award someone less of what they deserve based on their contributions because they have done something bad. The something bad in the case of the Reddit thread and the CNA article would refer to adultery or cheating, but there is a case where a wife has literally attempted to kill her husband through slowly poisoning him with arsenic, which is a literal crime, and she was properly punished through the penal code and criminal law and not through divorce laws and the woman's charter, because that's just not the purpose of divorce laws in Singapore. So let's look at the example I think most of the angry Redditors are interested in, which are the infamous quote-unquote gold digging scenarios, which I think would typically refer to marriages involving a husband that earns significantly more or is the main breadwinner of the household. So in long single income marriages that have lasted 26 to 30 years, the courts have tended towards an equal division of matrimonial assets. But if this were the case, 
there should be an extremely long gold digging process which can hardly really be called gold digging because the wife would have had to contribute significantly in non-financial ways as well. So for example, if the wife had given up her full-time job to home make and child rear. Okay, so I lost the footage for this part, but basically I just wanted to say that the court has observed that for moderate length marriages, they tend to award the homemaker 35-40% to 40%, and for shorter marriages, they tend to award only 25-30% to 30%, and that in general, the shorter the marriage, the less weight will be ascribed to indirect contributions. So now moving on to the issue of the maintenance of an ex-spouse, aka alimony, which is something that a lot of the Redditors talked about as well. So unlike the division of matrimonial assets, the maintenance of an ex-spouse here is predicated on one spouse being unable to support themselves financially and you having the capacity to support them. So from this sentence, we can see that one spouse is not just entitled as of right to maintenance, they have to make an application to court and prove that they are in need of financial support. So there are many cases where women, for example, will not get alimony at all because the court finds that they don't have any financial need for it. So there is a non-exhaustive list of considerations that the court will take into account and I will list them all here. Similarly, for the maintenance of a child, the court will consider these factors in relation to the financial needs of the child. And basically, the maintenance still has to be reasonable. I think a lot of the angry Reddit comments also kind of say that if you have custody of the child, you would be able to ask for a ridiculous amount of maintenance to pay for the child's expenses. But there have been cases in the past where the court has reduced the maintenance sums requested by the mom because they were either estimated at a very high inflated level or the court found that it was the mother herself who wished to indulge the children from her own pocket and therefore this was her own prerogative and the father should not have been made to contribute to this inflated level of expense. So basically paying for any additional things like luxuries or hobbies. So it's not the case for the spouse who the child lives with that they would be able to ask for an exorbitant amount of maintenance for the child instead of themselves and the court would just allow this to happen. This would still require a cost breakdown and the financial needs of the child and also the financial capacity of the parents involved. So now turning to the last issue that I will discuss today, which is the care, custody and control of children. So here, the court's paramount consideration is simple. It is just the welfare of the child. Based on the woman's charter, parents are mutually bound to cooperate to provide for the child. As for custody, I think there are a few comments in the thread basically saying that, oh yeah, the adulterous wife can just divorce the husband and get full custody of the child, but this is not the case. So custody actually refers to the authority to make long-term decisions affecting the child. And this is contrasted to care and control of the child, which refers to the upbringing of a child on a mundane day-to-day -day basis. So this refers to things like who the child lives with primarily, who makes the daily decisions, you know, who decides what they eat every day. That is care and control and that is separate from custody. So courts will only award sole custody in what I think are exceptional situations. So these are situations where one parent has basically disqualified themselves as a responsible parent and shows that they, for example, can't even take care of themselves, so how can they take care of a child? These are very extreme cases. It is very unlikely that in a general average divorce situation that a husband will not get joint custody of the child. People have always said that Singapore is very conservative and you know, the law upholds this idea of a nuclear family. So all the more it will want to ensure that even ex-spouses are able to co-parent. So they won't exclude a parent so easily and deny you custody of your child. Don't worry. So because of that, I actually think that a lot of these Redditors who are making these comments are just conflating custody with care and control. So basically, who gets the child every day, who has primary care of the child, 
who sees the child more. I think this is like, they just use custody as a general term to encapsulate this idea. So for can control, it is usually the case that the court will just choose the parent who is better equipped and able to care for the child on a day-to-day -day basis. So even if the child doesn't live primarily with one parent, it is usually the case that the court will still grant access to the other parent. At this point, I would also like to point out that someone committing adultery or infidelity doesn't necessarily make them a bad parent. I'm sure that some people might disagree with this point because they might look at infidelity and adultery or having affairs basically meaning that they have not put family first. But as long as they can show that they are able and responsible enough to be the primary caretaker for the child, that is what the court looks at when they grant uh, can control. And to jump in with a more practical observation, based on my previous family law internships, it seems like these can control and access orders are mainly for parents who are extremely acrimonious and require an enforceable court order to access their child. So for example, if your ex-husband refuses to let you visit your child because he has primary care and control and you have access for like two days of the week, but for whatever reason he never lets you see the child, that is when basically the law steps in to ensure that the ex-spouses can still co-parent with each other. So we need to remember that not all divorces are acrimonious and not all divorces are so heavily contested. So after explaining all of that, I would like to share some of my own personal thoughts and opinions on the matter. So I think a lot of the discontentment on the threat centers around how men are always treated unfairly by the law, how they are always given the shorter end of the stick. And you know, the law is something we conventionally associate with broader notions of justice and fairness. So I understand why they are so upset. but. Most of these comments are actually based on either very exaggerated or completely incorrect ideas of what the local law is. So I really hope that this video sheds a little bit of light on that and that if you have any criticisms or reflections, um, you know, you're at least reflecting on the correct law. <laughs> so at this point, the question is, are there actually parts of our current law that are unfair and sexist? So the short answer is, in my opinion, yes, there is. So the section in the Women's Charter that empowers a court to grant maintenance for current and ex-spouses still treats husbands differently from wives, and they do so without any sound basis. A TLDR is that only incapacitated husbands and ex-husbands who are unable to support themselves will be able to apply for maintenance from their ex-spouses. I mean the difference here is likely to be based on very archaic gender stereotypes of you know women being homemakers and the males being the breadwinners. So even within the women's charter itself, there is a demand for mutual obligations between husband and wife. So the ideal state of the law for all ancillary matters and all matters in general should require the same obligations to be owed regardless of whether you are a husband or a wife. So if you want to critique the law, I think this is one of the things that really needs to change. As you can see, there are areas of Singapore's family law that should be critiqued and reflected upon for being sexist and unfair given how times have changed immensely since the Women's Charter was incepted. But taking out your anger by spreading misinformation online isn't really helpful. I think it only incites more misguided discontentment. But quite frankly, I think that there are people out there who just want that to happen. And dealing with the clear elephant in the room, I mean, a lot of the comments are just patently sexist and presumptuous. I'm sure many people who have gone through a divorce themselves or have seen their parents or someone close to them go through a divorce can tell you that that shit is complicated. I think it's so easy to sit there behind a computer screen and point fingers without the full picture or to just summarize the situation as some poor fella being cut. So of course there are exceptions. There might be situations where there are spouses who are absolutely perfect and who love their SOs dearly and would do anything for them, but 
just happen to be married to a heartless monster. But I think that these are only exceptions. Nowadays, I feel like marriage is an expression of autonomy and agency and it is a choice that we make with another individual. This would mean that every step we take in our own marriages and even the steps we take to end it or move past the marriage, these are steps that can be jointly attributable to both spouses, not just one person. You know, you can't just point your fingers at one person and say that you are the only reason why this marriage ended. And I think all these people who go on the Reddit thread and who warn against marriage and warn against getting cucked by their wives and the law and you know they're basically viewing divorce as an inevitable end to marriage and it's actually quite depressing. I mean it's kind of like someone using insolvency law to convince someone to not start a company and it doesn't help that most of these people also interpret the law wrongly so it's just like a layer upon layer of misguided information. So this was a very long video. I think my brain has now turned into mush and the sun has officially set outside. But if you have any thoughts or opinions or if you have a divorce story that you feel was still very, very unfair, please let me know in the comments. I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. <laughs>